All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, as she told you, I'm a clinician at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm a clinician researcher, so no animal or mouse research uh, from me. The animal mouse research, which is vital, my job is to bring that into the clinic. So for all the physicians in the room, my research, my goal is to figure out what we're supposed to actually tell patients. And so my talk today, Ken uh, read me the Ride Act, or not Ken, sorry, uh, Jeff read me the Ride Act and told me I had to be quick here. So I'm gonna basically touch on the high points. Uh, my pictures and everything was made as brief as possible just to get, again, some of the high points across. And I've given lots of talks in the past that are online, so I'm gonna try not to repeat a lot of our data that we've presented in the past. Uh, my talk is Dietary Recommendations for Cancer, Warburg Metabolism, Clinical Applications. Uh, again, thanks everyone for having me. I, I was here last month. I always love to come to Ohio. It's like basically Pennsylvania, just everyone drives 40 miles per hour in the passing lane. And, and in Pennsylvania, our professional sports teams know how to win championships. So, <laughs> All right, we're off to a good start here. Uh, how, how, how do I flip? How do I change this to the next? Uh, is there a, what's, I don't have a remote. Is there, a, next slide please. Okay, so my uh, financial conflicts, uh, I received compensation for uh, diet and lifestyle books. I founded and run the Cancer Prevention Project. So a lot of my talks, the money I make goes to that uh, nonprofit. So I don't benefit from that personally. My dietary conflicts, we all have them. Uh, mine are that I eat a real food diet. Just to, thank you. Uh, I never count calories, and I believe the food pyramid was the largest public history mistake in U.S. history, and that will certainly affect everything I'm telling you today. So Warburg metabolism is, is basically a Ph.D. topic in itself, uh, so we're going to go through this here in, in 17 and a half minutes. Um, no, in all seriousness, uh, I'm just going to boil it down to one very simple picture. So depending on how you look at the Warburg metabolism, about 70 years ago, Warburg found that cancer cells rely on sugar, and that's basically the end of the Warburg hypothesis at that point. But realistically, if you dig deeper, there's a couple reasons why. So they have faulty mitochondria. That may be the cause as to why they use a lot of sugar for both energy metabolism and biomass production. It's a chicken or the egg. It may be the opposite. But anyway, you look at it, they rely on, there's a bottle of wine there, uh, fermentation, glycolysis, anaerobic um, metabolism of, of glucose for energy, even though using a mitochondria would be much more uh, efficient. Is it because they have faulty mitochondria? Is it because of something else? It depends on who you talk to. It's a very contentious topic. But any way you look at it, if there's glucose around, cancer cells tend to do better at growing and uh, being fatal. Realistically, from a clinical point of view, in terms of what do I say to patients from Warburg metabolism? This is still way, way, way oversimplified, but some of these pathways, which a lot of the presenters yesterday, especially yesterday morning, uh, discussed, these are kind of the key pathways when I distill down all these millions of metabolic pathways in terms of how is diet going to affect this cancer patient. Um, glucose and insulin can bind to the insulin receptor. That can upregulate many, many, many molecular pathways. On here I have AKT and mTOR, these are survival and growth pathways in cancer cells. IGF receptors, one we know less about, um, but that can be promoted through IGF, also insulin protein in the diet, and that can also increase cancer pathways. So realistically, we wanna decrease both of these pathways, and through drugs, we are trying to decrease both of these pathways, uh, but we can also do that through diet. We can also increase these pathways through diet, which many people talked about yesterday. So I won't dwell too much on that because I think at this point it's becoming very obvious. So the glucose connection in cancer cells, again, Warburg brought this up 70 years ago, and, and frankly, it's been shown again and again. One of the, one of the first studies that, that stood out in my field was a study from Johns Hopkins looking at blood glucose levels in patients with glioblastoma multiforme. Higher blood glucose was uh, correlating with poor overall survival. We've seen this in our clinic as well. On the left here, these are over 300 local regionally advanced pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, a lot of them were unresectable at diagnosis, which is nearly a fatal diagnosis. 
So they were treated with high dose ablative stereotactic radiation therapy. They got chemotherapy, some of them got immunotherapy, and then some of them got surgery. When we looked at all of their blood glucose values on the left, those patients experiencing a single blood glucose value over 200 had a significant detriment in their survival. And again, that's nothing new. We've seen this in a bunch of different cancer sites, but what we're trying to do is figure out which cancer sites do we see that. In our lung cancer, lungs are very, lung cancers are very metabolically active. They light up on PET scans. We did not find that glucose mattered in those cancer cells. So we don't know exactly why that's the case, but these are the studies we need to do to figure out before we start enrolling patients on clinical trials to see how we can affect this. And on the right here, as you see, with each stepwise increase of blood sugar levels over diabetes, there was a detriment in two-year overall survival from 130 milligrams per deciliter to 150 to 175. By 200, your survival at two years goes from a little under 50% to 26.5%. So this is a big deal. That's a big difference. And backing up, this is... Uh, our study, I've presented this before. So back, this was in 2014. So back in 2012, when the initial data came out from Johns Hopkins and some other places, we said, well, if blood glucose is bad, why don't we put these patients on a ketogenic diet and see if we can lower it? You can't always lower blood glucose below a normal threshold on a ketogenic diet, but you can bring it back down to normal in those patients that have a higher than normal blood glucose. So we did this just a very basic study uh, but again, in, in 2014, a ketogenic diet study in cancer patients was met with quite a lot of opposition, to, uh, to put it lightly. On the left here, these were all of our patients. There's about 55 total patients before surgery. They were diagnosed with uh, what looked like glioblastoma multiformes. They came to the ER. They were put on steroids. Their blood sugar shot up to about 135, 140. We know that anything over about 120, 130 based on some of these other studies uh, portends a worse survival. So they're already at that point. They get surgery on the blue here, uh, second to the left, they get put on more steroids. Their blood sugar goes up, it's almost 150 now. So they're rolling right in diabetes. They come in for radiation with a blood glucose of 150, which we know uh, will associate with a worse survival. All patients in red there in the middle, this was all of our group of patients during radiation. We check blood glucoses quite frequently. They're getting Temidar chemotherapy, and their blood glucose is right at the diabetes level. So in the pink there was our six patients that we put on a ketogenic diet just to see, just to see if we could lower their blood glucose, and it was certainly successful. So their average blood glucose was 84. Half of them were on high-dose Decadron, which shoots your blood glucose through the roof, and it stayed totally normal. This guy on the right here, in the gray, this is one of our patients. He was awesome, he was a chef, and he just had a giant binge day that day of his blood glucose, and it was still 90. So a very simple study, but some of the other docs were finally saying, whoa, there's, there's actually something to this. So realistically, the last slide I showed with these mechanisms is very simplistic, and this is a whole nother, whole nother talk for a whole nother day. But when I give my patients recommendations on what they should be eating or doing, I incorporate all these. This is basically my lifestyle pathways. So on the left here, we discussed at length this whole conference, how we can impact those metabolic pathways, insulin, glucose, IGF. AMP kinase is another one. It regulates uh, when cells are in feast versus famine. And when they're in famine from things like exercise, lifting weights, fasting, calorie restriction, or ketogenic diet, it is activated. It turns off all those growth pathways that cancers love. It also turns on our mitochondria. Again, mitochondria up, glucose down is bad for cancer cells. It also creates quite a bunch of free radicals in our normal cells, and then our normal cells create antioxidants to offset these free radicals. You do things like live longer, have better metabolic function, and hopefully fight cancer better. Pamela Goodman told us about 20 years ago now that breast cancer patients with higher fasting insulin have a poor outcome. She published this in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. This is at five years for women with uh, stage one and two breast cancer. So this is very curable. And their survival on the left there is about 95 plus percent, and that's what it should be. These women should be cured of their disease. However, as you move stepwise to the right, women with higher insulin, this is a growth hormone. It tells things to grow. It tells cancer cells to grow. As you move far to the right, you see their survival there drops uh, quite significantly, almost by 25%. So again, we want to lower insulin through the diet. And a lot of these are association studies, so there's limitations for sure. 
And then this is another study which was very intriguing, uh, 2014, and unfortunately we haven't heard much about it since. Um, there's a nurse's health study and several other studies where they spent hundreds of millions of dollars with tens of thousands of women looking at different risk factors for cancer. They looked at some dietary changes that didn't pan out so well. Uh, but that same group, this is the group at Harvard that was really trying to link uh, fat and breast cancer. They found that women who ate a high carbohydrate diet after diagnosis and had IGF receptors present on their cancer cells experienced a 5.5 times or 550% higher risk of recurrence. And women that were on a lower carb diet, their risk of recurrence dropped by about 50%. This is with food frequency questionnaire, so there's certainly limitations, but this is very intriguing as we know we can affect this through the diet and this study showing just that. And this is nothing new. Even Warburg's hypothesis at the time was nothing new. Um, a lot of people in this room know that uh, this data has been around. We quoted Cahill, we quoted some of these legends in the field. Uh, this is one of my favorite papers. This is the largest mouse study in low carbohydrate diets to date and it's from 1913, so what's that tell you? From the Journal of Medical Research, it's by Eleanor Van Ness Van Alsteen and S.P. Beebe, and this came out of Cornell, uh, where right now actually some interesting similar data is coming out of Cornell with, with Lewis Cantley's lab. What they found in these mice is that, in their words, there seems to be no reasonable ground for doubt in view of these experiments that a lack of carbohydrate in the diet produces such an influence upon the rats as to make them more resistant to tumor growth. When the diet includes carbohydrate, the tumors grow luxuriantly, and when the diet does not include carbohydrate, the animals show a marked resistance. So this is nothing new. These guys knew over a century ago what was going on. And so unfortunately, in, in humans, we don't have a lot of data in terms of the ketogenic diet and outcomes for a lot of reasons, a lot of issues. It's tough to get funding, and it's tough to get these studies uh, through IRBs. So instead, uh, Rainer Clement and a group of us looked at all of the mouse data performed a meta-analysis, certainly with limitations, but it's the best we got. And as you see, all those studies to the left of that dotted line at the one show a benefit of a ketogenic diet. All those that cross um, show um, no benefit, no detriment. What we found that overall, there's a 45% uh, risk in death in the mice that were on a ketogenic diet. The key though that we also found was that the diet was effective when it was started either before cancer was given to these mice. So we see it as a preventative measure. And if you look back through the mechanistic support of a ketogenic diet, that's very consistent. The other thing we found was it was beneficial when the mice were undergoing treatment. So in Dr. Sheck's study, which I'm sure she'll bring up shortly, when they were getting radiation or when they were getting chemotherapy, the ketogenic diet made it work better. By itself, it did not work as a cancer treatment. So that's something we need to keep in mind. It works synergistically with treatments. And we don't know which treatments those are, but these are the things we need to look at. And this is what Lewis Cantley and uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee has done recently. And uh, this got a lot of publicity. I don't know if anyone out there has seen this. This was in Nature. Um, it was a very good study, but apparently when you have a Pulitzer Prize winner on your team, it gets a lot more publicity. Uh, so they were giving mice a PI3 kinase inhibitor, uh, which basically blocks insulin and its down regulation. And that should work to help fight cancer cells or kill cancer cells. The problem with it is, as you see in the middle here, if you're blocking insulin, you're blocking its ability to pull glucose from the blood. So these mice were getting hyperglycemic. And this is a, a well-known side effect of these PI3 kinase, mTOR, other inhibitors. So what they do, they put the mice on a ketogenic diet. And it made the medication work better, and it got rid of the hyperglycemia. So just like the GBM study that I showed you, if you put mice and humans on a ketogenic diet and then put them on a medication that makes their blood glucose shoot through the roof, it offsets that. So for that purpose alone, uh, we need to start exploring the ketogenic diet a little more. Uh, as you see to the left here, blood glucose shoots through the roof with a normal chow diet. This is uh, their work. As you see to the right, C-peptide with a control diet is quite high. Metformin did not work so well in their study. Uh, SGLT2I -T, uh, T2 did, and a ketogenic diet did. And then as you see to the, to the C down there in the middle, uh, ketogenic diet, and their uh, testing medication worked significantly synergistically to decrease tumor volume. So these are, the light, these are the studies we need to do more of. I have a patient right now with a, a glioblastoma who is on neratinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor, and he's on a ketogenic diet for a similar reason. It's an N of one, so we'll see what happens.
These are more of the studies we need to do. There's a lot of other metabolic interactions that we need to assess as well. We looked at statins in our patients, and uh, statins actually improved survival in uh, local regionally advanced pancreatic cancer patients as well. There's an 11 8 pathway and multiple other metabolic pathways that are disrupted by statins. This had nothing to do with, with circulating cholesterol or anything. But those patients on them actually did a lot better, and they responded to the radiation and chemotherapy better. So what we need to do is keep insulting the metabolism of cancer cells, and we can do that through other mechanisms as well. And what we found in our uh, lung cancer patients, the, the numbers were limited, so it really just was a trend, uh, but it was quite close to significance. Those patients that we were ablating their tumors with stereotactic radiation, those patients uh, in the in the green here had blood glucose levels in the diabetic amounts, and we actually had worse local control with the radiation. So simply having more blood glucose around uh, makes the radiation work much less effectively, and this was one of the first studies to show that in humans. Another thing we found is that simply having excess adipose tissue, and this is, a, this, this is the first study of this kind, simply having excess adipose tissue makes radiation work worse. So we're treating your pancreatic cancer with high dose radiation and the risk of it coming back, that picture show, the risk of it coming back doubles. It goes from uh, in 10 months it returns versus uh, over 20 months. Unfortunately, a lot of these tumors do return because they're quite hard to treat. And as you see on the right here, freedom from regional recurrence, those curves start separating patients with BMIs of 25 to 29.9. So simply having excess body tissue secretes hormones, increases insulin, does all these, this metabolic derangement that actually makes our radiation not work better. So to me that is, we can affect this and we can affect this uh, quite instantly and we can hopefully affect this before people are even diagnosed with cancer. So as a clinician, we need to look at population studies and remember there's some statistical issues with those. We need to look at mechanistic support. So the next couple studies coming out, or the next couple um, researchers coming after me pay attention to the important uh, studies that they're presenting. Animal studies, we have quite a bit. We don't have a lot of randomized, well, we don't have any randomized human studies on cancer patients with ketogenic diet or some of these other things. But if you look back at that data, right, the overarching ski, uh, picture here is insulin, glucose, excess adipose tissue. We know in randomized studies in humans that we can affect those. So as last time I checked, a low carbohydrate, calorically unrestricted diet, as one over a low-fat, calorically restricted diet 28 times. They've tied 29 times. And a low-fat diet, which is often recommended to cancer patients, if you add up the, the Super Bowl championships of the Bengals and the Browns, you, you get the number of times a low-fat diet's been successful. So, <laughs> and, but as a clinician, this is data that I can show to my other physicians when they say, what the heck are you doing putting patients on a low-fat diet or on a low-carbohydrate diet? I say, I'm just supporting the data here. That's all I'm doing. And, and again, there's a, there's a lot more to this. There's a lot of other metabolic pathways that we're going to have to affect and we're going to have to research. So the recommendations I make really do not sway at all from a paper that we published, what is it now, six and a half years ago. Uh, for breast cancer patients. The same thing, we wanna decrease adipose tissue, we wanna decrease glucose, we wanna decrease insulin. So you're probably thinking, if that was published in 2012, why haven't things changed? So my research group, I have some savvy med students, they actually filled out a Freedom of Information Act request, and if you fill this out with the government, they have to tell you what they're doing at their hospitals, and this is what they're doing at their hospitals. This is what is mandated, mandated by Coke to be put into their vending machines. 50% of the drinks on this list directly are against what the government's saying, right? You only can have 10% of your daily calories in sugar throughout the entire day. 50% of these supply that in a single serving. This is the other, other mandated items, candy bar. It's mostly candy bars, pretzels, potato chip. How the heck are we supposed to do anything in this research field if we're telling patients not to eat the same foods that they're selling in our hospitals? This, this irks me to no end and we should need to stand up and fight this. You should not be at any hospitals. We need to riot, tip, tip these over. <laughs> Last but not least with my 20 seconds here, um, I got married two months ago and uh, that's my beautiful wife. And this, this was our wedding in Italy. We had a seven course meal. We had 
she's Indian, we had vegetarians, we had my derelict friends, alcoholics. Uh, <laughs> We ate a seven course ketogenic diet meal and everyone loved it, Not, no one noticed anything. So these are foods that culturally support um, our patients and patients will enjoy, so thank you.